Hi, thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Linda Nashcroft. I'm a lecturer in climate science and science communication at the University of Melbourne. And it's a real honour to present our work today, uh, the work of our team at Climate History Australia about rescuing historical weather observations to prepare for the future. I want to start, if I can, if my computer will let me, with this video. This is a video that shows the weather observations every three hours, or the weather, a picture of the global weather every three hours in 1860 and 1861. The colour shading there, the blue and the, and the red, indicate temperature. The green is rainfall. The striped lines are uh, wind speed and direction. And then that grey shading that you can see there, that's what's known as the fog of ignorance or the fog of uncertainty. And that's when we don't, that is where we don't know enough about what went on in the past to really say for certain what the weather was like. We can't tell the difference between just the average over the last 50 or 100 years and the actual weather patterns. And without that information, we can't explore how extreme weather events are changing. We can't accurately draw these kind of climate stripes like the one behind, the ones behind me that tell us how the climate is changing. We don't know for certain what pre-industrial climate and weather looks like. And the key to all of this, the key to this map, is the other thing that I didn't point out, and that is the black dots. The black dots that you can see on this map slowly blinking in and out or moving around the place. And they are, of course, weather observations. And with these weather observations, the fog of ignorance lifts and we get a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty accurate picture of what was going on. One last thing to notice from this graph and this map is that in Australia and in the Southern Hemisphere in general, there aren't a lot of black dots and there is a lot of fog. We've got two, maybe three stations sometimes around the Australian region, sometimes a ship if we're lucky. And so any single black dot that we can add onto this map will really help light up our understanding of past weather and past climate, which is just so crucial for understanding how the world is changing and how the world is going to continue to change. So the work that I'm doing and the work that we're doing at Climate History Australia is really about finding more black dots to put onto that map. Our project started in 2019 and it builds off an Australian Research Council linkage project that uh, was run from about 2009 to 2014. That was a, a partnership between libraries, the Bureau of Meteorology, Murray-Darling Basin Authority and the university sector as well. Both that project and this project is led by Joelle Gerges, who's now at Australian National University. She's an IPCC uh, lead author as well. We also collaborate with the Bureau and with the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes. So we do a lot of work um, not only rescuing instrumental weather observations, but also documentary accounts of past weather and climate events. We also use paleoclimate information, so tree rings, ice cores, coral records, those kinds of things. But what I want to talk about today is two citizen science projects that we've run over the last couple of years about rescuing historical instrumental weather data. Now, the first project that I want to talk about is uh, observations from the survey office in Adelaide from 1843 to 1856. These beautiful logbooks that you can see here were uncovered by some volunteers, a volunteer group out of Adelaide who do some incredible, incredible work uh, finding and recovering and imaging old uh, weather observations that exist in the archives or in the bureaus, deep, deep dank basement somewhere in Adelaide. And these observations are sub daily. So, you know, um, three or four times a day, records of temperature, of pressure, of the wind, uh, of remarks as well of um, we don't have how much rain fell, but we have whether the rain fell or not. And also descriptions of cloud types, which is very rare to be more than 160 years old and have cirrus cumulonimbus, those kinds of things. Not only are these images beautiful and a really important historical document, they also fill a crucial gap in Adelaide's climate history. We have some observations from the 1830s, uh, thanks to an amateur scientist, someone who's interested, a new settler in Adelaide. And we also got observations from 1856 onwards at the Adelaide Observatory. But these records fill a really crucial gap. And look at them. They're, they're beautiful. The next data set that we looked at 
is another gap filler, and these are records from Perth from 1880 through to 1900. Again, we've come across some lovely archival diaries from 1830 through to 1857, and then the Bureau's got records from about 1900. But these observations, again, they kind of fill that crucial gap and help us try to build a continuous record for Perth from near when it was colonised up to the present day. So we ran the Adelaide project in 2020 and we launched this second project from April to July 2021. Now I want to talk you quickly through the process that we used in developing these projects. I say we, but I mean our citizen science officer, uh, Caitlin Howard. We're so lucky to have had a dedicated citizen science officer on this project. We're quite a small team. There's only four of us really. And most of us are doing lots of other things as well. So to have someone dedicated to setting up and running this project was was just so wonderful. Uh, but there are a lot of steps and they, that involved a lot of technical knowledge as well as great communication skills. So the first thing we needed to do was create an inventory of the data sources that we had of these pictures of these images. We had the hard copy books, images of those were taken either by the volunteers or by National Archives. And then we had to get a picture of what every single page looked like, looked like to see if they were consistent and if they would be appropriate to be broken up into bite-sized chunks to run as a citizen science project. We didn't want to ask people to take on a whole page and digitise that. We wanted people to be able to dip in and out of this work. So we tried to uh, see if both of these sources were appropriate for that kind of activity. Once we did that, we'd set ourselves up on Zooniverse. So Zooniverse is a platform about transcription, about uh, image rescue, data rescue, trying to classify images. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's quite a, quite a large online citizen science platform. And it has been used in weather data rescue activities in New Zealand, in the UK, and um, quite successfully on an international scale. But this is the first time that it had ever been used in Australia for weather data rescue. From there, we had to design a workflow structure and also um, see how to segment and break up these beautiful big logbook pages into pieces of work, into kind of small tasks that volunteers could do. Not so big that they would get lost or that the data would sort of, uh, a date would be skipped or something, but not so short that they didn't feel that they were being connected to the weather and the climate. So the Adelaide record was a little more complicated. We broke the chunks up into maybe one week or so of data. And then for the Perth records, we broke it up into half a month. And we also looked at every variable separately too. So people could choose if they wanted to uh, digitize the weather remarks or the pressure or the temperature. And we graded those on to easy, moderate or difficult workflows. We then had to prepare the images, which is quite a tricky task as well, because you have to slice all the, um, the files nicely. And there was a, there's a fair bit of technical requirements there, either using creative adobe creative suite or using some um, coding skills so that took a long time i know that box is the same size as all the others but that was actually took a really long time and then of course have we have to test it we had to test it the universe requires that you do that and once we were happy with the result with the beta testing we uploaded and prepared the rest of the images sorted out a launch date and prepared our engagement campaign so this engagement campaign worked with uh, traditional media as well as social media presence and connecting with existing networks, including the Australian Citizen Science Association, historical environmental groups, uh, atmospheric and ocean science groups, uh, volunteer groups as well around Adelaide and Perth. Once the project kicked off, we monitored the progress and the forums that existed on Zooniverse. It's a great platform for exactly this kind of work where, where volunteers could talk to each other and ask questions of us and, and tell us about interesting things that they found. And because of Caitlin, we were able to really engage during the project and also give regular feedback. One thing that we did, although we probably could have done it a little bit more, is assess the data as soon as they came in, whether it was looking for issues, deliberate or not so deliberate, and give feedback to people who were involved. And then finally, reporting on the results. And we did this not only through the Zooniverse platform, but also through blog posts and social media posts and those kinds of things. And we've been quite quick, I think, in the turnaround of when we've when we've told people, oh, here are some preliminary results, here are some graphs that we put together, here are what your numbers can tell us. And I think that's been, I think that's been a real success of the project. 
So both projects ran for about the same time and we got, you know, nearly 2,000 volunteers. Not that they're, they're all separate. It's a little bit hard for us to tell how many people were involved in the Adelaide project that then came back to do the Perth project. But we had over 1,000 people volunteer to digitise the Adelaide records and we digitised over 33,000 records in under three months, which is pretty amazing. We also had a real a real lot of interest in um in media, we got over 1.6 million people connected either through uh, traditional media, social media, and local media as well. The Perth engagement looked a little bit lower on paper, but we still managed to get a lot of observations digitised, over nearly 70,000 by at least 700 people in about 10 weeks. Um, both of these were done during lockdown, and there's a discussion to be had about how much uptake there would have been if people were allowed to be out and about a bit more. But Adelaide and Perth were not so locked down as we were in the eastern state, so I'm not sure how much of a role that played. Um, these images down the bottom here are just a couple of examples of what the project looked like on Zooniverse. We ran some surveys and we got some good feedback, particularly after the Adelaide project. The Perth one, uh, the survey wasn't taken up quite so much, but the feedback that we got is like the feedback that you would, you would just love to have <laughs> from a citizen science project, both in terms of how people enjoyed the activity and what they learned. I learned heaps about the climate in Adelaide, more than I didn't know about it before. Acquiring knowledge about Australia's climate is really valuable. And this project allowed me to be a part of science. Like that's, you know, it was really reassuring and encouraging to read those kinds of comments. Um, we also heard from somebody who was using this project in their tertiary class. They were teaching bioanthropology, I think, and they were getting their students to take part in this activity, which I think is pretty cool. And Wendy here, who is a part of this presentation, she uh, stuck around and continued to digitise after the citizen science projects were formally done. So we've, we've built up quite a relationship with her and she really enjoys the interconnection between climate and historical events. And so this project allowed her to connect those two things together, which has been, you know, it's one of the reasons we love this work too. Scientifically, the data are proving to be pretty good. I mean, we have to do a bit more analysis to see how they are in terms of um, absolute quality. But in terms of what the volunteers have done, the data seem to be great. Uh, we asked, we got each value digitised up to eight times so we could be more confident in the results. Um, and I think that might have been a little bit of overkill. We probably didn't need to do quite so many, but similar projects in other parts of the world have used that as the retirement rate of particular images. So we stuck with that. The accuracy did decrease a little bit as the when the tasks became more complex, but it wasn't necessarily data entry issues. It was whether there was a skipped value or a skipped day. And so observations and dates kind of got a little bit out of joint, which is quite common when you're doing data entry. And I just wanted to show you here this graph of the gaps that are being filled now. So those, that orange and the purple, these are the new observations in Adelaide at least, and we have a similar value for Perth. You can see this uh, continued value, this like extended series is being built right now. We learned a lot in this experience, mainly that setting up these projects take a lot of time and that weather data, historical weather data in Australia just doesn't quite have the same interest as it does overseas, maybe because we're a little ashamed of our colonial history or because we have a smaller population, I'm not sure. Um, we learned that data quality needs to be checked early. We did have one person who entered um, deliberately incorrect data. And so picking that up early would have been really helpful, I think. Obviously, clear communication with the volunteers is super important when it comes to uh, learning, telling them what the project is about and what how we're going to share results with them. And that goes for all citizen science projects, right? And as I said, replicating eight times uh, might not might not necessarily be required. But we've done heaps. We've got so many more black dots now, nearly 100,000. And we've engaged people from across different generations too, people who care about climate science and people care about who care about history. And I think that's really important. We have a lot of things that we're doing next, lots of more, lots of values to be found, lots of data analysis to be done. But I'll leave it there. And I really look forward to talking to you about it further.